Ariola, Vernikoff, Palladino, and Joseph. Now I'll pass it along to Josh. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, we'll now turn for opening statements for some of the bill sponsors. Um, I'll also kind of note that we're going to do a panel of uh, public testimony in advance after or before administration testimony. So we're going to do some opening statements and then we're going to let a, a couple of directly impacted individuals speak and then move on to the administration. Um, so for the uh, built uh, opening statements, uh, public advocate Williams, um, Council Member Hudson, Council Member Stevens, uh, Councilmember Caban, who's on Zoom. So, uh, public advocate, you may go ahead and then we'll move on to the other folks. Thank you so much. As I mentioned, my name is Jemani Williams, public advocate of the City of New York. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chair Hanks uh, and the members of the Committee on Public Safety for holding this important hearing and for hearing my bills. Also, want to thank the speaker for being present and aligning myself with her statements. Uh, um, we often talk about uh, some improvements that uh, have occurred, uh, but I, I do know and always say that the two buckets. Uh, as the speaker mentioned, that we haven't seen any movement at all, in my opinion, uh, is transparency and accountability. Every day, New Yorkers are stopped by the NYPD. Sometimes this results in a search, a level three stop, where an officer has legally aff legal authority to detain someone and prevent them from leaving, colloquially known as stop and frisk. The NYPD is required to stop, report on these stops so we know that black and brown people are disproportionately stopped. Black, Latino, Latinx, New Yorkers made up 91% of reported stops as of 2020. Motor vehicle stop data for 2022 revealed similar disparities. The NYPD has disproportionately frisked and used force against black and Latinx Latino people. As we have seen all too often, these stops can escalate quickly to violent or even deadly situations. We still, however, do, have the, do not have the full picture of who is being stopped by the NYPD as they are not currently required to report on level one and level two stops. Despite, their, despite being lower level stops, the feeling of being stopped questioned and possibly searched by police is indistinguishable from the experience of level three stops. That is why I've introduced intro 586, which would require the NYPD to report on all levels of police stops and encounters, including the location where they happened, the demographic information of those stopped, the factors that led to the interaction, and whether the encounter leads to any use of force or enforcement action. According to the New York Civil Liberties Union, in 2022, 49% of drivers arrested following traffic stops were black and 39% were Latinx and Latino. I have introduced intro 781, which will require the NYPD to include in vehicle encounter reports the justification used by an officer to conduct a vehicle stop if an observed off offense was cited as a justification for a vehicle stop, and whether the offense was at the level of inter infraction, violation, misdemeanor, or felony. In order to effectively address racial bias in policing, we need to know the full scope of the problem. And in a time when Mayor Adams has resurrected the NYPD's notorious street crime unit, now called neighborhood safety teams, this information is crucial. In addition to underreporting on stops, the NYPD has historically shirked responsibility when it comes to granting access to body-worn camera footage. This lack of compliance with requests for access to body-worn camera, body camera footage seriously impedes investigations by oversight agencies, including the CCRB and the Department of Investigations, OIG, NYPD. The NYPD has falsely denied that footage exists or refused to turn over footage citing embellished privacy issues and have been generally slow to respond to requests. While many other cities give their police oversight bodies direct access to body-worn camera footage, New York City does not, causing delays and roadblock in the CCRB and OIG NYPD investigations. These delays deny justice for victims of police abuse and brutality and increase New Yorkers' fears and distrust of the police. My bill, intro 0585, and a bill I'm proud to co-sponsor with Speaker Adams, intro 938, seek to increase and exp expedite oversight agencies' access to body-worn camera footage. Intro 585 would require the NYPD to share all body-worn camera footage with OIG NYPD and the Department of Records and Information Services within five days of the recording. Intro 938 would grant the CCRB direct access to all footage recorded by Office, office of Body-Worn Cameras. CCRB would have real-time connectivity to network services hosting digital files of body-worn camera footage, allow them to search, view, and use files for the purpose of investigating, prosecuting allegations of police misconduct. We have seen time and time again that there is systemic bias still existing and the NYPD have consistently impeded any effort to hold them accountable by oversight agencies, elected officials, members of the community, increasing police presence in our communities will never increase public safety simply by itself when the people in those communities only associate police with trauma, fear, discrimination, and abuse. I look forward to working with the City Council, the CCRB, and OIG NYPD to ensure that the NYPD complies with the bills we are hearing today. I did want to also say that uh, it's important to talk about the disparity in the stops. 
and I also mentioned disparity of violence that occurs in black and brown communities, often the latter is the excuse for the former. However, this was the same thing I heard 10 years ago. And so if the response was supposed to solve the disparity in violence in our communities, it has not. It has never. It will never. And so while we are clear that there has to be uh, some um, police uh, activity due to certain things that are going on, what we are clear is that the overuse of policing will never solve these problems. Ten years, we've been saying. Black and brown people have been shot and killed and harmed, and for ten years we've seen over-policing, and it's still the same disparity. So I'm hoping with having discussions, we don't get the same pushback that we always get, because it doesn't help keep our community safer. What we're asking for is simple information and simple changes. The mayor, uh, Eric Adams, was involved in actually getting the initial information, the initial information um, that we needed to get the information on the stops. Uh, now that we have it, I hope he joins us with this as well, uh, and that we can get forward to talking about the real issues of public safety and what police uh, involvement is, as well as other uh, agencies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Public Advocate. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Hudson, Stevens, and then Caban for another opening. Thank you so much, and thank you, Chair Hanks, for providing me the opportunity to speak about my bill, Introduction 538. As members of this committee likely know, the Right to Know Act requires NYPD officers to identify themselves during investigative stops and obtain proof of consent to conduct a search that would otherwise have no legal basis. Officers are required to report on the number of times it gained consent to search individuals and demographic data on those individuals. My bill, Introduction 538, is a common sense, good government bill that will bring much needed transparency to the NYPD. This bill builds on the Right to Know Act by requiring the NYPD to report on the number of requests for consent to search. As such, this would expand the report requirement to include not just searches that happened, but also those that were requested. We need this data to fully understand the comprehensive scope of search requests by the NYPD. For all we know, NYPD officers might be attempting to stop New Yorkers at significantly higher rates, but New Yorkers who know their rights deny those attempts. Without a law requiring the NYPD to provide this information, we're unlikely to voluntarily receive it from them. This bill notably includes provisions for requests to search things like vehicles, homes, properties, or even a forensic sample of DNA and it requires the NYPD to report whether the officer used interpretation services when attempting to obtain consent to search from someone with limited English proficiency. Simply put, we need true police oversight, transparency, and accountability. That means everything from immediately firing officers who harm or kill New Yorkers, disbanding the SRG, deeply investing in community-based safety alternatives, and by passing these two bills. I'd like to thank the 27 co-sponsors of this bill, many of whom are here today, and Commun Communities United for Police Reform for their fierce advocacy. I urge every member of this committee to support this bill, co-sponsor it if you haven't already, and work with us to shed more light on the NYPD's activities. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Next, we're here from Councilmember Stevens, followed by Caban. Transparency is much needed when it comes to government, which is why I believe intro 638, a local law to amend the administrative code of New York City in, re in re relation to reporting on the use of large donations received by NYPD. It is imperative that the public knows who, where, who and where the money is going and how it's being spent. This piece of legislation will ensure that, that no larger, no, there will no longer be blind spots and create more transparency, which in, the, which in one of the largest funded city agencies. This transparency will allow us, allow us to provide a more efficient oversight to ensure that the NYPD is correctly util, utilizing monetary donations. I would like to thank all the co-sponsors who signed on, and if you have not done so, please sign on to this bill, and I'm open to having a dollar with NYPD about this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And next, we'll turn to Councilmember Caban, who will join us through Zoom. I'll unmute you in just a second. Let me go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to give an opening statement. As was mentioned before, um, a couple of my bills are being heard, and you know, if this committee's recent hearings have made one thing abundantly clear, it's that we owe the people of New York City a greater degree of oversight over the NYPD. At the hearing on the Strategic Response Group, otherwise known as SRG, that the department didn't attend, um, we learned from the Civilian Complaint Review Board that they are not privy to any data on bias-based policing, and clearly that's intolerable, and far less than we owe the people of New York City, for sure. 
And at last week's preliminary budget hearing, the department's testimony in response to the chair's careful questions about misconduct was immediately contradicted by that of the CCRB, though once again, NYPD leadership was not in attendance to hear or answer um, for this discrepant account. And so I'm grateful that we're hearing intros 443 and 386 today in the interest of transparency, accountability, and our New York City where no one need fear that they will be on the receiving end of bias-based policing or other forms of police misconduct that will escape the attention of those of us charged with oversight. And so thank you to Queensborough President Richards for partnering with us on these bills, and I will uh, pass it back to y'all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Council Member. Just for the record, I'd like to let everyone know that we've been joined by Council Member Mealy. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as I mentioned, we're gonna begin the first panel with um, some members of the public. I'm gonna list uh, the following names. Please uh, come up to the dais as your name's called. Um, we'll be giving each member uh, three, or each individual three minutes to, to speak, and then we'll move on to the testimony from the administration. So first we'll hear from Gladys Williams, Sean Williams, Sammy Feliz, Steve Cahoot, Ibrahim X and Robert Willis. Yeah, so so come on up to the to the dais and, and make your yeah. And, and you all could go in whatever order you want. Excuse me. My name is Ibrahim X, and I'm a vocal New York leader with the Civil Rights and Homelessness Unions. I'm not a politician, but I always represent Crown Heights. I'm a black man, I'm homeless, I have a criminal record, felonious criminal record, violent, whatever you wanna call it. I also live with mental illness. I've been policed and criminalized for each of those identities. I've been stopped by police in this city more times than I can count. Unfortunately for people like myself, I'll give a few names. Tyree Nichols, Saheed Vassell from Crown Heights, Sean Bell, George Floyd, Sandra Bland. We all know the names and the hashtags. Their lives were stopped by police stops. My life has also been almost stopped. I've had police put guns to my head. In fact, if you notice, when I open my mouth, I'm missing a tooth. I'm missing a tooth as a re result of a police stop in Queens. Officer Halsey George, in particular, if he's listening. I've been stopped by the police for locking up my bike at a railing and told that, oh, I might be stealing cars because there was cars next to the railing. I've been stopped by the police for being in a smoke shop and asked, what was I doing in a certain place that I was never at? I've been stopped by the police for being in the train station and wrongfully accused of not paying my fares because they just assumed that I didn't pay my fare. All these are interruptions in my life. To you, their words in intro 586, to Tyree Nichols and the other people that uh, Council Member Adams, excuse me, Speaker Adams mentioned, their lives were stopped by police stops. And I just wanna take a minute as someone who is personally impacted to share my condolences and my inspiration for the Antonio Williams family. Cause I know my mother's not alive, but she'd be sitting right here. My father might be sitting right here. So I, I take this very deeply because I have a child. In fact, I have a few children. And I never want to be sitting here in their position. So I'm going to fight every day of my life. Whether you want to hear me or not, I'm going to be here. I do, you normally would not be here. I'd be on the block. I'm going to stop hanging out on the block and I'm going to start hanging out here. 
until you realize that people like me are being stopped. And we're not just being stopped. Our lives stop when the police stop us. You need to understand that because maybe it's boring to you or if you're Caucasian, you've never had that happen. But unfortunately, it happens. And if you want to live in an America where that's allowed to happen to me, then I don't know what to tell you. I, I can't live in that America. And I'm not going to live in that America, not that New York State, and not that New York City. So I urge you to follow your council members and pass intros 538 and 586, because you can't ask me for accountability through the police if they're not having any accountability. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Hello, my name is Gladys Williams. I'm the stepmother of Antonio Williams, who was unjustly murdered by the NYPD on September 29, 2019. I'm also a member of the Justice Committee, an organization that works with families who's lost loved ones to police. Antonio was a loving presence in our family. I remember the day he found out he was having a son. He recorded his reaction and shared that joy with us. Now, there's a player missing in the basketball competitions with his father and his brothers. There's a heartbreaking absence at our, at our holidays when the families gather together. And Tony was simply waiting for a cab, not bothering anybody when he was approached by the plainclothes cops. The NYPD was different definitions of level one, two, and three stops. If officers don't have the reasonable suspicion you're involved in a crime, that's level one, and two, and you should be free to leave. Antonio should have been free to go. But the reality is to us that the different levels of the stops usually feel the same. NYPD doesn't tell you what level stop it is as they approach or any time. It's frightening. You feel as though officers are detaining you. You feel like you are in danger. But in worst case, cases, the NYPD escalates these encounters and someone ends up beaten or killed like our like what happened to our son Antonio. If we had more transparency on how the NYPD is using low-level stops to harass and, is and abuse black and Latinx New Yorkers before Antonio was killed, maybe he would still be here today. If officers are forced to report every stop and where they're making them, they'll be less likely to use these stops in illegal and abusive ways because they know they'll be, they, they be exposed. That's why my family and other families who have lost loved ones to the NYPD are calling on the city council to pass the How Many Stops Act immediately. We are also calling for Mayor Adams and Commissioner Sewell to fire all the officers involved in our son's murder and disband neighborhood safety teams. We must take action to ensure that what happened to our sons does not happen again. How Many Stops Act is one of the several pieces that must come together for real NYPD transparency and community safety. The City Council has the opportunity to move NYC away from safety regime, regime and relies on, relies on policy and criminalization to the one priorities, safety, justice, and dignity for all. The first step for you to take is passing the How Many Stops Act. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. How you doing? My name is Sean Williams, father of Antonio Williams, who was unjustly killed September 29, 2019 by NYPD officers. Like my wife mentioned, he was standing outside waiting for a cab when plainclothes officers jumped out. Unconstitutional stop or illegal stop, chased him, beat him, and murdered him. Um, Antonio, the NYPD claims Antonio had a gun, but was never pulled, and that was never fired. My son was not a threat to anyone, to any officer, I've never seen anybody being a threat with their back turning, running away. He was, should have been allowed to walk away, run away, whichever, because they had no suspicion to stop him. But they initiated the whole thing. Not only did they murder my son, they killed one of their own. And they blamed that on him. 
that's why passing this stop, I, that's why passing this how many act, stops act is very important. Then also we have the mayor of New York patting himself on the back about what the what happened in Memphis with the Scorpion team, but putting the same four people on the street and just rebrandishing it with a different name is just, just all you did is just switch the name up. Same people out there, you're just trying to make it seem like it's something different, but the same officers. Then you bring back the same thing that, the same law that got my son and many others murdered by the NYPD. Met people like Eric Gardner and others. No reason for stopping them. You just decided that you're gonna be the judge, jury, and executioner. You're gonna make your own laws. Even though you swore to protect the community against criminals, so how do you protect the community when you're the criminals yourselves? When you initiate all interactions and run the streets, the community of black and Latinx communities pretty much being a bully. This is approaching people as if it's my way and this is it. It's what we say and if there's nobody there to speak or see anything, who is your word against the person who's deceased, pretty much. And they can't speak for themselves. So that's why passing this act is so important. Because it, it has to stop sometimes. Why not now? I want to thank you both for your, your testimony. I offer you my deepest condolences. And I appreciate your courage. And, and everything that you said here today. And I also want to thank the speaker for allowing the public to come and testify so you could really hear the voice of the people. So I appreciate it. Next. Hi, my name is Sammy Feliz. I'm the brother of Alan Feliz, who was unjustly stopped in his car, beaten, tasered, and shot and killed by NYPD Sergeant Jonathan Rivera and officers Michelle Emanzar and Edward Barrett in the Bronx on, on October 17th of 2019. I am also the founder of the Allen Feliz Foundation, and I am also a member of the Justice Committee who um, helps organize families who have lost loved ones to police violence.
in my community. And some of these stories are so much worse. My PD. My building, my, my neighborhood is policed by the PSA 4, the 7th, and the 9th precinct. Three times as many cops doing this to us every single day. And they don't get reported because they classify them as level one or level two stops. So there's no documentation of this. You can look it up. There's no records of this. I don't even know what the cops' names were in half of these situations. They don't remember me because they do this every day. So all it is is the traumatizing memory in the back of my mind of what happened, in the back of all our minds in, my com in communities like mine. And this is why I chose to represent JC in the Floyd JRP process, because these are life or death matters. Level one and level two encounters need to be reported. The, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna finish right now though. Um, the facilitator of the JRC, uh, of the, of the uh, Floyd JRP process actually agreed and said that these things should be reported, but the court failed to implement these recommendations. That's why we have to come to you again. We have to return to the city council and demand that this act gets passed. Like, we need transparency from the NYPD. And I, I, I can't fathom, like, why this is such a problem to just let us know what's going on, be transparent with the communities that you're policing, that you're harassing, that you're abusing on an everyday basis, that you're murdering. Just be transparent. And maybe if the transparency was there, as to what Jumani was saying every, earlier, maybe if the transparency was there, they'd, have, they'd know that that accountability is coming and this, these wouldn't lead up to these situations. I apologize for going over my time. At the end of the day, we need to pass the How Many Stops Act. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony and your advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, city council members. My name is Robert Willis. I'm here representing Latino Justice, an organization that has fought for the fair and just treatment of the Latinx community for over 50 years, but also as a lifelong New Yorker who grew up in the South Bronx. And like these gentlemen here have spoken, I too can tell many stories of having encounters with the police that were unwarranted and didn't deserve any interaction at all. I know all too well the destructive dominance that the New York City Police Department wants to have over the citizens of New York. Until this day, I have to always calculate how to behave, how to carry myself whenever police are in the area simply because I'm a black man, simply because I've lived in New York City my whole life and understand what an intrusion it can be to my life at any moment that any given officer can just invade my personal space for no reason at all and it not get documented. New York City level one and two police stops may not result in an arrest, but they still are dehumanizing and daily intrusions into the lives of most New Yorkers, into many New Yorkers, most of whom are black and brown. These stops are daily reminders of who are in control of the streets, who with the biggest and most dominated gang can touch you at any moment. That's the message that they're trying to send. These, under, these unreported stops force us to address the role that racial profiling and unequitable treatment or of already marginalized minority groups pay in making our community safe. Mandatory reporting on these stops would benefit New Yorkers for several reasons. First, it will, provide, it will provide transparency and accountability for police officers and would help ensure that they're following proper procedures and protocols. Proper reporting should provide an opportunity for a person to receive some kind of understanding of why they were stopped in the first place. Secondly, it would allow policymakers and the public to better understand the scope and nature of policing activities in our communities, including any potential biases or disparities. Not acknowledging the historic behavior of the NYPD or trying to ignore it would be just leaving our black and brown communities ripe and open for disrespect and mistreatment by any given officer on any given day. On any given day. Thirdly, it would help identify areas where additional training and resources are needed to improve community relations and reduce the likelihood of unnecessary stops in the first place. Overall, 
mandating reporting of level one and two stops can only help promote effective equity policing practices while also protecting civil rights and liberties of individuals in all New York communities. That's why Latino Justice is asking for the City Council to pass the How Many Stops Act with a veto-proof majority so that New Yorkers can know that their police department is being held accountable and they can start respecting us better in our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony and for your advocacy. I'll pass it back to Josh. Thank you, everyone. Um, if any members have questions, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll move on to the administration for testimony. Um, Councilmember De La Rosa. I just want to make a comment. Alan Feliz was my constituent. Sammy is his brother. And I just want to thank all of you for being here today. I want you to know that this council is listening to you, and we're going to work towards a semblance of justice for these families. Thank you for coming here, and I appreciate you. Thank you, Council Member. Okay, thank you all for your testimony. We appreciate it. For the administration, we're going to do two panels. First, we're going to hear from NYPD, Law Department, and Doris. Department of Records, followed by another panel with CCRB. So to start with, for the police department, we have Michael Clark, Deputy Commissioner Amy Litwin, Director Allison Arnenson, and Chief Matthew Pantillo. For Department of Records, we have Sylvia Collar. For, for Law Department, we have Nancy Savasta, Muriel Good Tufant, Eric Eisenholtz, and Beth Niedow. So if, if you all want to pull up some extra seats, or I know that some of the Department of Records is there for Q&A, so you could. Um, I'm going to just affirm the following statement. Um, do you just raise your right hand if you're testifying and just affirm the following. Uh, you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before the council and answer honestly to council member questions. You do. Seeing you acknowledge that, you may go ahead. Thank you. I, I do. I do. Good morning, Speaker Adams, Chair Hanks, and members of the council. I am Michael Clark, the Director of Legislative Affairs for the NYPD. I'm joined here today by Chief Matthew Pontillo, the Chief of Professional Standards. Allison Aronson, the director of the department's body-worn camera unit, and Deputy Commissioner Amy Litwin of the Department of Trials, Department of Trials Unit. On behalf of Police Commissioner Kitchenel Sewell, I'm here to testify before your committee regarding the department's commitment to transparency and to comment on the bills being heard today. The New York City Police Department does not fear transparency. We embrace it. Transparency, oversight, and well-informed public scrutiny on the whole leads to not just safer and fairer policing, but better and more effective policing. The department issues dozens of reports and publishes significant troves of information that are accessible through public-facing online dashboards, such as the Use of Force dashboard, the Hate Crimes dashboard, the Department of Personnel Demographics dash dashboard, and the How Did We Do dashboard. We publish a profile on every officer in the NYPD, which includes their disciplinary history, the trainings they have completed, department recognitions, and ward and arrest processes processed. Moreover, we publish our crime statistics for every precinct on CompSat 2.0, as well as traffic collisions with our Net Traffic Safety Forum. We hold dozens of monthly meetings citywide, including meetings in every precinct and every police service area, where we provide data and answer questions from the community. I think it's safe to say that there's no agency in the city, and quite frankly, any police department in the country that is more transparent than the New York City Police Department. And it's also important to acknowledge that this level of openness with the public comes in part from our work with this council. We have successfully worked together many times to negotiate and pass bills that increase transparency and that are implemented in a way that, are, that is operationally feasible. These partnerships between the NYPD, the council, and the communities you represent have proven to be an invaluable tool in effective neighborhood policing while fostering a policing infrastructure based around trust and communication today and into the future. I would now like to turn to the bills being heard today. 
Intro 938 would require the department to give CCRB direct access to its body-worn camera system. The department opposes this legislation. The bill itself acknowledges that there are videos the department cannot provide CCRB, such as videos depicting arrests that have been sealed and videos containing images of sexual assault victims, as providing such footage would violate state law. In 2022, the department recorded more than 9 million videos via body-worn cameras. Moreover, cases can be sealed at any time, which means that the MITD must conduct not only a one-time review, but must continuously review the roughly 24 million videos currently in the NYPD system. It would be an insurmountable obstacle to give CCRB direct access to our body-worn camera system while ensuring that they do not have access to any videos that are required by state law to be kept confidential. It's an absolute barrier to this legislation. The MIPD and CCRB have worked together to ensure requests from CCRB are prioritized and that CCRB has provided videos related to their investigations in a timely manner. Currently, the NYPD has an average turnaround time of three to four days for the nearly 3,000 video requests received each year. Intro 585 would require the department to provide the body-worn camera videos to the Department of Investigation and the Department of Records and Information Services, or DORIS, within 120 hours of recording any law enforcement activity. This bill would present similar obstacles as Intro 938 in that the operational burden would be insurmountable and would severely affect privacy rights, including those of sexual assault victims, victims and those with sealed records. The intent, of this bill is to presume, the intent of this bill is presumably to make videos available for public inspection. Allowing members of the public to inspect videos of individuals possibly having one of the worst moments in their life is problematic and should be discouraged. Body-worn camera video is maintained by the NYPD for an agreed upon amount of time, ranging from 39 months to permanent. Providing Doris with access to videos does not further the goal of police accountability and is operationally infeasible for the NYPD. Moreover, we have, active and collaborative, we have an active and collaborative relationship with, D, with DOI. We are permitted by law, the NYPD will provide body-worn camera video if it is requested by the Department of Investigation. Intro 586 would require the department to report each and every investigated encounter conducted by the NYPD, including level one and two encounters. At the outset, I feel it's important to define the scope of this bill. It has been named the How Many Stops, yet, yet, Stops Act, yet would require reporting on interactions that are not police stops. The levels of encounters defined in this, bill are, in this bill are utilized by courts to determine the nature of interactions between officers and members of the public. Level one encounters the most basic interactions between officers and members of the public. This includes everything from speaking to witnesses when responding to a 911 call, to canvassing for video after a crime, to assisting sick passengers on the subway, to asking New Yorkers whether they have seen a missing child. During level one encounters, people are free to ignore officers and walk away. The object is to gather information and not to focus on the person as a potential suspect. These encounters are not stops. Level two encounters occur when an officer has found a suspicion that the individual has engaged in criminal activity. While officers may request explanatory information at this level, members of the public are still free to leave. Level three encounters are stop, question, and frisk encounters, also known as Terry stops. Officers may initiate a level three encounter when they have reasonable suspicion that a person has committed a crime. At this point, the individual is stopped and their freedom is curtailed for a brief period of time to investigate a crime. The NYPD already reports this information related to level three stops on our website and to the council. To be clear, level one and two encounters are not stops and individuals are free to leave. They can refuse to answer questions and walk away. The NYPD responded to more than 7 million 911 calls last year, many of which would have, have at least one level one encounter. We're reporting on these encounters would require an officer to take time away from responding to other calls or conditions to fill out detailed reports on each response and demographic information for each individual encountered. These low level interactions should not be treated as the same level of stop where police are detaining a per person. Let's look at a couple of examples to illustrate how onerous this requirement would be how ir and how irrelevant much of the information gathered for any serious accounting of police activities. A citizen calls 911 to report a fight between two groups of people in a park. Multiple units respond and find the melee over and multiple people injured. Officers would begin providing aid to victims and conducting a canvas for suspects. The officer would be required to take the democratic demographic information of each person they provide assistance to for the, and for the possible dozens, possibly dozens of witnesses they talk to when they could be canvassing the areas for suspect. Or how about a case with a missing five-year-old child, which may be the most time-sensitive investigation one can imagine. Dozens or hundreds of officers are dispatched and dozens or hundreds of everyday New Yorkers are asked if they've seen the missing child. To ensure the accuracy of reports, the officers would need to stop and take down each witness's demographic information. This would invariably slow down the investigation and as such would hinder officers from obtaining valuable information that may lead to finding a child. And what value would taking this information have towards the goal of providing police academy, accountability? This bill could be detrimental to building community and police re relations as it disidentifies officers from approaching people who might need their help. 
The former federal monitor in the Floyd Davis Ligon case himself argued in his report against this level of detailed reporting on low level encounters because the burdens of the documentation outweigh the benefits. The monitor did not just acknowledge the extreme burden on the department, but also recognized that even if the data would show disparities, it would, it would not show discrimination because the critical task is to identify the relevant population at risk of being stopped. For first level encounters, however, there's no way to identify the relevant population for whom an officer might have an objective, credible reason to approach. Because there are so many different kinds of encounters with the shared level, label of level one, there's no similarity among them and therefore no standard determining whom should have been encountered assuming there was no discrimination. Without knowing what opportunities the officers declined to follow, there's no way to say anything meaningful about selective enforcement. Because of the federal monitorship, we began recording the recording of level one investigative encounters on body one camera video. We agreed to classify the body one camera video as level one video whenever there was at least one level one encounter and there was no higher level of encounter interaction. In 2022, officers classified 3,223,987 videos as level one encounters. Because of the way level one encounters were counted, the number of video undercounts the total number of level one encounters that were initiated. This is merely the number of videos categorized as level one encounter. Officers can respond to a call that have dozens of level one encounters as the canvas for witnesses and video of an incident. But would still only count as one encounter in our data. Moreover, the data would not count, for example, a video where officers respond to a 911 call, have level one encounters with one or more witnesses, and ultimately find and arrest a suspect. That video would be categorized as an arrest. The body one camera system was not designed to report on these level one encounters, and in order to comply with this bill, if enacted, officers would require to fill out a form for each and every person they interact with, which would take significant time away from patrolling our streets and keeping the public safe. Turning to intro 583, the law currently requires the department to report on the number of consent searches conducted disaggregated by apparent race, ethnicity, gender, age, and precinct. Intro 538 would also require the department to report on those instances where the consent was sought to search a person, vehicle, home, or property, or to collect a forensic sample, and the number of times the, search w the consent to search was denied, including whether the subject has limited English proficiency, whether interpretation services were used, and if so, the type of interpretation service used. The department already collects and reports on the number of times consent to search was sought and denied, and it's currently part of our policy to ensure inv individuals with limited English proficiency are apprised of their right to deny consent to employ interpretation services where needed. The department looks forward to further discussions as the most effective way to achieve this bill's intent. Intro 443 would require the NYPD to provide the Commission on Human Rights all records related to closed bias based policing complaints. In 2021, the City Council passed a law granting the responsibility for investigating bias based policing complaints to the police officer against police officers to the CCRB. While the law took effect on January 20th last year, CCRB finalized the rules related to bias-based policing in October of 22. This oversight authority was given to CCRB because CCRB is an entity that was created for the sole purpose of running oversight on, on policing, while CCHR has a much broader mandate. It's premature to undermine the new scheme that has not even had six months to operate. Intro 386 would require the department to provide a monthly report on the number of misconduct complaints received, including, but not limited to, misuse of force, harassment, and offensive language, and any response, including investigation of discipline. While the MYPD does not oppose reporting on discipline, it should be noted these categories uh, fall largely within the ambit of CCRB and are currently reported monthly by them. Requiring the NYPD to report on the same redundant categories would be a misuse of valuable resources that would provide no benefit beyond what CCRB currently provides. Intro 948 would increase the time period and publicize the reporting requirements under Administrative Code 14-150. Tripling and quadrupling the number of reports that is required on this law would pose significant challenges, considering the breadth of information that is currently required to be reported. Additionally, there are portions of the report, such as disclosing deployment inf information, which may not be appropriate to be publicized on our website. I would like to note that many of the new reporting requirements concerning overtime require detail on such a granular level, they'd be onerous and difficult to track. We do, however, look forward to discussions on how we can achieve the bill's intent. Intro 638 would require the department to report on donations received that have an aggregate value of more than $1 million. This bill expands on existing reporting that is required by rules promulgated by the Conflicts of Interest Board. The department looks forward to working with this council on this legislation. Intro 781, would require the department to amend our public vehicle reports. By requiring the department to report on the basis of each stop, we look forward to working with the by, by requiring the department to report on the basis of the stop, each stop. Again, we look forward to working with the council on this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about these important bills, and we look forward to answering any questions you might have.
Speaker Adams, Public Advocate Williams, Chair Hanks, members of council, good afternoon. My name is Muriel Good Trufant, and I am privileged to serve as the first assistant corporation counsel. I'm pleased to be here to offer the law department's comments regarding intro 944, which is before you today. I am joined by Eric Eichenholz, managing attorney of the law department, Beth Nadal, deputy chief for practice management in the litigation support division, and Nancy Savasta, the Deputy Chief of the Tort Division in charge of risk management. Intro 944 would impose new requirements upon the Law Department to compile and upload particular information concerning civil actions filed in state or federal court against the police department, individual police officers, or both. As proposed, the amendment would mandate reporting within 15 days of receipt of new cases and or case dispositions, meaning that the law department would be required to post information every business day of the year. Similarly, in keeping with the notice requirement of Administrative Code Section 7114, on every business day, notices would be sent to the Department of Investigation, the Comptroller, the Police Department, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and the Commission to Combat Police Corruption Concerning Case Activity. Further, on a quarterly basis, the number of new actions alleging improper police conduct and the number of case resolutions would be disclosed to the same entities. In compliance with Administrative Code, Section 7114, since 2018, the Law Department has posted on our public-facing website information on certain cases, which includes claims involving the use of force, assault and battery, malicious prosecutions, and false arrest or imprisonment. The posted information includes the court in which the civil action was filed, the name of the law firm representing the plaintiff, the name of the law firm or law firm agency representing each defendant, the date the action was filed, the kind of improper police action alleged in the action, and if the action has been resolved, the date of its resolution and the manner in which it was resolved. Whether the resolution included a payment to the plaintiff by the city, and if so, the amount of such payment. The Law Department has been supportive of the Council's intent to provide more transparency. We have successfully increased transparency through the Law Department's publishing of five-year summaries of case dispositions and matters with alleged improper conduct by police twice a year. In order to ensure accuracy, the Law Department conducts extensive reviews, research, and quality assurance to make sure that these biannual reports are as accurate as possible. The proposal to require posting 15 days after each complaint is received or a lawsuit is settled would ensure that the posted information would be inaccurate, frustrating the very purpose of public disclosure. The Law Department is handling approximately 5,114 state and federal cases with allegations of alleged police improper conduct. For the first six months of this fiscal year, approximately 546 new cases were received and 552 were disposed. Overall, our office represents the police department and individual members of service in more than 7,000 cases. Often, we receive complaints 
with officers named as John Doe's or with misspelled or commonplace names. When the law department receives a complaint, we review the allegations in the pleading and work to obtain necessary records to understand the factual and legal underpinnings of the case. This process invariably takes time and publicizing information about cases in a period as short as 15 days would lead to premature and inaccurate information. For example, unless there is a conviction in an underlying criminal case that is the subject of the complaint, the law department must secure a release from the plaintiff pursuant to New York Criminal Procedure Law, Section 16050, in order to access sealed arrest records. In the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, plaintiffs are required to serve a 16050 release with their civil rights complaint. Thereafter, in recognition of the time required to access police records, identify the involved officers, make representation decisions, answers to complaints are due 80 days after service of the complaint. Releases are not required to be served with complaints in state court actions, and thus, identification of the officers can take, at best, many months. Further, both parties and claims are added as civil discovery progresses. A malicious prosecution claim against several unnamed police officers may change into a false arrest case against two named officers. Thus, information that might be posted by the law department within 15 days of a complaint would invariably be inaccurate or simply wrong because a party was erroneously named in the complaint. Problems would also arise in reporting case dispositions within 15 days of resolution. After the parties agree to settle a case, the controller's office has 90 days to pay the settlement. During that 90-day period, there are various lien checks, including for outstanding child support that are conducted. As a result, the settlement amount and the amount paid to the plaintiff by the city may be different. A settlement reported within 15 days of the agreement may not reflect what the city ultimately pays to the plaintiff. Moreover, the current time frame of publication every six months ensures proper vetting of the relevant data for accuracy. This vetting is both time consuming and necessary. We urge the council not to implement a 15 day reporting period which would require daily uploads of flawed and often premature information to a public website. With respect to the proposal for the quarterly reporting of statistical data, the law department could furnish such data and we look forward to working with council on that aspect of the bill. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments to intro 944. My colleagues and I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you so much. At this time, we will hear from Speaker Adrian Adams and for, as she will kick off the questioning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and welcome to all of you once again. Thank you for being here today in person to testify before this council. Uh, Director Clark, you, you went through them, but not everyone is familiar with the different levels of police encounters referred to as levels one, two, three, and four. Right. Uh, can you please take us through the distinction between each of those levels and detail whether or not the NYPD is currently required to activate their body-worn cameras during each, indicating when the NYPD is supposed to tag such recordings? 
So, yeah, so level one, two, three, and four, we're supposed to be recording at, at all levels. Um, currently, that wasn't the case when we first rolled out the body-worn camera program. Um, I believe it was only level threes and fours, but now it's level one, two, three, and four. When did that change? Last year. Okay. How many of each level were in fact recorded in the first year of this administration? And additionally, how many of each level encounter were found to be in compliance with the constitutional requirements? So I think in um, the number of level ones that we I were documented as level ones, it was 3.2 million. Uh, the level number of level twos um, was about 35,000, and about the number of threes was about 35,000. But this is videos that were classified as level one, two, and three. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the number of level one, two, and three encounters. So, for instance, if two officers do a level three encounter, they both might classify their video as a level three encounter. Um, if two officers do a level two, they might both classify, even though there's one level two or level three encounter. For level ones, it's the same issue, but level ones is more likely to have multiple level one encounters for each video. So, for instance, if you respond to a 911 call and you're looking for witnesses, you may talk to 10, 15 people, all of those would be level one encounters. But would end up showing up as two on our body one camera system when both officers tag it as level one. I see. So, so it seems, well, it's, it sounds a little muddy, a little convoluted, I guess, to the, to the layperson's um, mind, but I'll just move on from there. How does the NYPD and or someone auditing those stops review and or determine whether or not a stop or all stops for that matter were conducted in a constitutionally permissible manner? I mean, would, you, was, would the officer explain the stop or um, to determine whether they had an objectable, credible reason for a level one stop or a founded suspicion for a level two, or are you reliant on viewing the video itself? Good afternoon, Chair. Um, so it, it's a combination of, of all of those. Uh, we have a, uh, an auditing program in place uh, where we look at uh, approximately half of the recorded stops that occur each year. Uh, we do random samplings of other police actions like arrests. Uh, we look at other police activity uh, related to radio transmissions to look for indications of stops and enforcement actions and then review those actions uh, to make sure they're constitutional. Part of this auditing uh, regimen was developed in collaboration with the court appointed monitor and the attorneys uh, for the plaintiffs uh, in the Floyd stop and frisk case. Uh, so. That auditing protocol was, was piloted beginning in 2015, 2016, uh, and, and then ultimately court approved uh, as a viable method of auditing uh, not only stops, but also uh, other police encounters, including arrests, to see how the incident began, uh, and then whether or not the police action was constitutional and if the stop report was prepared. We also uh, do significant sampling of body camera video, looking across all types of encounters uh, to determine what the police action was, uh, what it was predicated upon, and whether or not it was proper. Uh, so for example, in my office alone last year, we reviewed more than 73,000 body camera videos as part of that uh, auditing process. Uh, also uh, beginning uh, last fall, uh, we began a new audit uh, whereby we randomly sample uh, body camera videos each quarter, and, and the goal is to identify a statistically significant sample to get us to a 95% confidence interval, uh, looking across all body camera videos uh, across the city, uh, and then sampling those to identify uh, what the incident is, uh, what the police action was, and whether or not it was appropriate. And then if it's not appropriate, then identifying uh, the follow-up action that, that needs to be taken. And as Director Clark indicated late last year, we changed our body camera policy. So as he indicated, when we first began the policy and first began the rollout in 2017, uh, we, uh, by policy, limited the number of incidents that police officers were required to record. At the time, we, we just didn't know what we were getting into in terms of uh, bandwidth and all of that data going through our network. Uh, but as we rolled out body cameras and got some experience uh, with it, 
uh, we were able to expand. So what began initially as only a mandate to record certain enforcement actions, uh, late last year we changed the policy to now record all police action, all police civilian interaction, other than you know, maybe like a, a routine consensual conversation, good morning, how are you today, uh, kind of thing. But any other type of call for service, investigative action, enforcement action, 911 call, 311 call, no matter what it is, any, any uh, inquiry, witness canvases, uh, all police activities must be recorded from beginning to end. Uh, we also instituted a, a system last year working with the body camera manufacturer to enhance our ability to add certain identifying information to body camera videos. So for example, we can tag videos with certain uh, uh, information, like an arrest or a stop and a stop report number. Uh, difficult to do, it, it, it is quite burdensome. You've got to upload the videos first uh, and then go into the system. Uh, but working with the manufacturer, uh, we, we uh, rolled out an enhancement late last year to their app uh, where officers can do it on their phones now. So it's still a multi-step process. It's still uh, time consuming, but, uh, and, and that's where, you know, Director Clark mentioned uh, the number of videos categorized or tagged as, as a stop or a level one. Uh, that's where it comes from. So by making these improvements, we've improved the ability to not only capture that data, but to audit it as well. Thank you. The NYPD's use of stop and frisk or level three stops still dramatically disproportionately impact black and Latinx New Yorkers. Without this data on lower level encounters, how do you know whether these enforcement practices are being used in a manner that is just and effective or in a manner that like level three stops is racially discriminatory or not? So what I would say about the level one encounters and, and just to go back, um, when, when the New York State Court of Appeals came up with level one, level two, level three, uh, they, they were trying to get a handle on assessing police civilian encounters that resulted in an arrest or recovery of evidence. And what the court said ultimately was that they're not just going to look at the constitutionality of, say, for example, the recovery of an illegal firearm. They're going to go back to the very beginning and look at the initial interaction the police officer had with the civilian to make sure it was for a proper purpose. And if they determine that there was not a proper person, then any evidence that comes after or is derived from that uh, would, would be um, uh, suppressed and would not be admitted into evidence. Uh, so as a result of that, this, this level one category is, is a very, very broad category. And to be clear, level one encounters are, are not stops. These are the routine interactions police officers have with members of the public every day. Uh, and as Director Clark gave a couple of examples, you know, imagine somebody calls 911, police officer response, uh, or two police officers typically will, will respond. The first question is, did you call the police? Are you okay? What happened? That immediately makes that a level one encounter because it's a police officer seeking information from a member of the public. Uh, probably the most, I think, dramatic example uh, and, and, and we see uh, these incidents increase exponentially in the summertime, uh, looking for a missing person, especially a lost child. You know, people go to the beach, they go to a park, their child wanders off, they call the police, and now police officers are going through the park or the community or the beach with a photograph or a photograph on their phone, just walking up to as many people as possible, saying, hey, we're looking for this lost child. Have you seen this child? Every one of those is a level one encounter, right? Uh, the intrusion upon the civilian is, is minimal. It's for a public service function. Uh, it, it, it is not uh, really intrusive on the person being approached, and it's absolutely necessary to public safety. Uh, I would argue that the mechanisms that we have in place with the vigorous auditing, auditing of stop reports, the auditing of arrests, the auditing of use of force, uh, the, the random sampling of body camera video, which now includes every police interaction. So we're capturing all those lower level engagements uh, to make sure, one, that stops are, are not being underreported, uh, and, and two, that the uh, police conduct is appropriate. Thank you. Director Clark, in your testimony, I'm gonna quote you, I think it's safe to say that there is no agency 
in the city. And quite frankly, any police department in the world that is more transparent than the New York City Police Department. To what extent has the NYPD complied with CCRB requests for information and documents in relation to CCRB investigations of biased policing? So we have provided them the, all the information related to the specific incident. Uh, right now we're currently in dialogues with them to figure out exactly what they need beyond the allegation that's in front of them. Um, this is something that came in, uh, you know, into their purview last year and their rules went into effect in October. So this, we're still in ongoing dialogue to try and figure out exactly what it is they need and how to get it to them. So is that a, is that a zero? As far as the extent that the NYPD has complied with the CCRB requests, is that a, the NYPD has not complied with the requests by the CCRB? It is, we have been working with them and trying to figure out exactly how to provide them the information and how we have given them the information related to the specific incident that's being reported and complained about, um, but it's the greater universe. We're still working with them on figuring out how to get to them and what, what to give them. Okay, because we've been informed that those requests have, de have been denied, that all of them have been denied to date. What is the current process for the CCRB to review footage recorded by officer body-worn cameras? Good afternoon, Speaker. Good afternoon. Um, currently, CCRB sends requests to my unit, which is the body-worn camera unit within the Legal Bureau. They send daily emails to us with their requests to a specific email account. Um, we process the requests and return the results to them within an average time frame right now of three to four business days. How often does the NYPD respond to CCRB requests with non-responsive body-worn camera footage? While that number, that number has certainly decreased over the years, um, when we first deployed the cameras, um, not every officer was uh, deployed with a body-worn camera footage, so certainly the number of negative responses back in 2017, 18, and even 2019 um, was significantly higher. Currently, it's rare that there is no body-worn camera footage of an incident, especially with the new protocols that have been in place that we're recording every interaction. Primarily, it may be arrests that are handled by specific units in the department who do not, uh, who currently do not have body-worn cameras, but overall, Overwhelmingly, the number of responses that we give contain body-worn camera footage. Okay. And in what circumstances would the NYPD withhold or redact body-worn camera footage? <clears throat> Currently, we only withhold or redact body-worn camera footage involving sealed adult arrests pursuant to Criminal Procedure Law 16050, juvenile arrests or detainments pursuant to the Family Court Act, as well as victims of sex crimes pursuant to the Civil Rights Law 50B. And, and just to be clear that if there's a waiver, we'll provide it from the individual whose case is sealed. So frequently CCRB is able to get waivers mm -hmm. to get the video, but sometimes it's not possible. I was just about to ask how often, what's the frequency of that, of those waivers? So currently the frequency is very high. Um, initially we requested, or we um, required uh, written waivers. Currently we accept verbal waivers from them, so the CCRB investigators and in their requests to us document on that request that they've obtained a verbal waiver from the complainant or a parent or guardian in regards to a juvenile. So currently right now we don't have many requests where waivers are required or redactions are necessary. Okay, we might want to take a look at that uh, in more depth. How does uh, NYPD determine what body-worn camera footage to release publicly, how to edit it, and who is responsible for making and approving determinations of what is released publicly? So, so public, you mean public releases pursuant to FOIL, Freedom of Information Law, or public to an external agency? An external agency. Um, so currently, all of that is handled by my team. We process all requests, whether it be um, criminal discovery to a state prosecutor or federal prosecutor, as well as to the law department, administration for children's services, or CCRB. We handle all these requests the same. When we receive them, we search. I have a team who searches the evidence.com database where the body-worn camera footage is stored. We locate all responsive footage pursuant to the request. We do not determine what we release. If it's part of the request or if it's part of the incident that's the basis of the request, we provide all of that footage. 
Now, depending upon who's requesting it, whether it be a public release pursuant to FOIL, I have a staff of attorneys who review it to determine if any privacy redactions need to be made or departmental redactions that need to be made, and then they're all approved by a supervisor before release. The same as requests for external agencies, we have multiple layers of checks within my team to ensure that we locate all responsive footage. And we also have a, a policy of re releasing video um, whenever there's a use of force where one or more by one or more officers that result in death or serious physical injury, um, or when the officer discharges a firearm and decides, firearm discharges and hits another person, or if there's a sort of incident that requires that's a you know great interest of the public, then the PC can also do that. So we'll release body one camera video of those incidents as well, affirmatively. Okay. What's the internal process for safeguarding sealed body worn camera footage to prevent unauthorized access? So currently all of the footage is stored within that cloud-based storage system. Um, right now there is no technology in place to differentiate between a sealed record within this cloud-based system versus an unsealed record. Um, the one uh, requirement we have in place is a limited number of NYPD personnel have download capabilities within the system. So internally, if anything needs to be downloaded by the department, they would also be reaching out to my team in order to use footage for an investigation or for whatever their purpose may be. So when we receive those requests, we do the same check that we would for any external agency, and before we release it to them, we would check to see if it's a sealed record or confidential. Well, how does the department respond to claims that it improperly commingles sealed and unsealed records, including in its body-worn camera database? So currently, again, speaking only on body-worn camera, all of those records, sealed or unsealed, are within the system. And again, while we can work with the third-party contractor, there's no technology available right now that would differentiate or segregate this material. So currently, they, it is all stored within the system. There's also an ongoing lawsuit um, about our storage, storage of body, of not body one camera, of sealed records. Um, and we're with the plaintiffs in the court working through you know, policies on how to improve the, our practices. Okay, sounds like, sounds like we definitely need to improve that. Um, I'm going to ask just a couple more questions because I know that I have several colleagues that, that want to ask questions as well. I want to touch on, uh, on the vehicle encounter reports and uh, the bill that I did sponsor and was enacted. We've seen the reports coming out uh, lately, the results of that legislation. There have long been concerns regarding the racial demographics of individuals subjected to traffic enforcement. Current NYPD data confirms that black and Latino individuals are the disproportionate target of traffic stops, arrests, searches, and use of force. In 2022, the NYPD conducted over 673,000 traffic stops, 77% resulted in a summons for a minor violation, and only 2% resulted in an arrest. While black and Latino drivers accounted for nearly 55% of all stops, they made up approximately 90% of arrests, use of force incidents, and searches that resulted from these traffic stops. Stunning, stunning to anyone. Several police departments across the country are moving away from conducting traffic enforcement and stops because of the evidence that they disproportionately escalate to dangerous situations for drivers. Now, how is the NYPD considering its own policies in this context? And are there any discussions about limiting the use of officers to conduct ve vehicle stops, particularly when precipitated by potential minor violations? So, I mean, I think that's something we're always want to make sure is that the vehicle stops are being done safely. Um, we have a vehicle stop manual. We've done training on it. Um, you know, and we've also supported the ability to use automated enforcement to enhance what we do. But I think, in our opinion, the NYPD officers is an important part of traffic safety, um, working with our partners at DOT to make sure that we're trying to curb reckless driving and make sure that that part of the city is safe um, while doing it in the safest manner. Um, that's the goal, but we, we support. Are there more reckless drivers in black and Latino communities than other communities? Well, I mean, I think, you know, what 
the, the data you pointed out to is about 55% of stops. I think that roughly matches the city's demographic data for black and Latino in the city. So I think it shows that we're not targeting any particular community with vehicle stops. Um, I get your point when there's arrest, it does escalate in a, in a small period of time, there are arrests. Um, the most common arrest is for unlicensed operation without uh, a license. Does the uh, NYPD know what percentage of New York City drivers are black and Latino? Uh, I do not know that. Okay. How many complaints has the NYPD received alleging bias-based policing arising from traffic stops and enforcement, and how many have been substantiated? Uh, I don't know how many have been based on a traffic stop. I can get or attempt to get that information. Um, 